verse they'd like to say? today how thankful I am. I don't have a close relationship with my biological mom, but I'm very thankful that the Lord has blessed me with an amazing stepmom and my grandmother and my aunts and everybody that he has put in my life to make up for that and given me godly examples to follow. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Anybody else? Yes. So I've been trying to look on Marketplace on Facebook to find things that I can buy for our house when we get to certain things. Um, and I've been looking for some windows. Well, I was able to get a still of some brand new windows. Um, only paid like $500 for them. And there's like five brand new windows that were about $400 a piece. So I'm praising the Lord that I was able to snag those up. Amen. Praise the Lord. God provides. That's great. You got one here? Yes. Job chapter 5 and verse 17. Behold... Happy is the man whom God correct. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Amen. Yep. Glad God chastens us. That's actually one of the, the evidences that you are his child is when he chastens us. So that's a good thing, but it's also not a fun thing, but I'm glad he does because he loves us. Good. Got one? Um, um, I prayed about my shoes being found. I only had one shoe, but God answered my prayer a full church and he Mommy, found my shoe. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so did he got no friend. That's awesome. I tell you what, that stuff will stick with children. That's good. Teach him to pray. He lost his shoe, had one shoe before church, prayed that the Lord would help him find a shoe, and his mommy found the shoe right before church. So <laughs> praise the Lord for that. I had to do that because he's like convinced it because Ann literally finished praying. She opened the door. We looked for it last night. She opened the door. Up to the closet. I'm not even sure why she was in the closet. There was a shoe. And Mike was like, You hid it in there, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and Aaron was like, No, I really didn't. And she didn't. And it was like, As soon as he finished praying, she just opened the closet and there was a shoe. And I was like, Well, that's going to be a good thing. She was in the closet praying. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Um, I prayed about the shoe. Yes, Doug. We went to Alabama last week to see my oldest brother. And it's a quick trip. It's about 1,200 miles over. My brother's getting either dementia or Alzheimer's. And uh, you really can't carry on a conversation now. He, he just repeats over and over and over what he's been saying. We just pray that if he's going to get this stuff to where he won't know none of us, I'd rather he go ahead and take it. He does know the Lord. Yeah, it's good. Even in his state of mind, he still says God is good and God blessed him and God's still good. Yeah. Yeah. I know where he'll go. Yeah. I, I, I've seen this all time stuff. I had a grandpa on the same side. Got it. And he got violent. So never violent bone in. It does. It, stuff like that tends to bring out the opposite personality, it seems like. And, and uh, 
But you know, I've talked to many folks over the years that's had Alzheimer's or even dementia, and you talk to them in a normal conversation, and it's like they're out there in left field, and they're talking about people that you know have been gone for you know, 30, 40 years. But then you start talking about the Lord and what they want. A lot of times it just clears up, and it, it's just amazing the difference in how. And I really believe you know the Lord does that to give them some understanding. And then when the conversation's done, you're done talking about the Lord, and you just start having a conversation, it's, it's gone again. And uh, it just happens like that so oftentimes. I think it's amazing. Anybody else? Word testimony, answer to prayer? I want to give you a chance? Yes, sir. I just want to thank God that you put a good God in my life. Amen. Yep. Amen. Very, very blessed we are. I'm thankful for the godly ladies we have in this church and the godly men. God's blessed us. Uh, we have a blessed church. Amen. Every time I get you know, a speaker in here, it uh, doesn't matter where they come from, what their background is, they always tell me, you know, once they meet our church, it's like, oh, man, you got a great church here. You got a great church. And I know I have a great church, and God's got a great church what he's doing here. But when you're here, you take a lot of things for granted if you're not out seeing other churches and what's going on. We are very, very, very blessed. Don't ever take it for granted because God can remove our candlestick just that quickly. And uh, we need to have a heart for souls and a heart for people and a heart for one another. I think that's very important. Anybody else? Can I sing the song? You sure can. Me personally or? Sure. Can I sing? <laughs> <laughs> it ain't going to be about you, but it's oh, going to okay. be about mama. <laughs> Where would we be without the prayers of our mother? You want to come up here and sing? That way you can be on camera. Whatever you want. Yeah, come on up here. <laughs> well, it would be good for people who won't be able to see it. A lot better looking people besides me. I'll stand here next to you. Get a glare off our heads. Hello, Mama. I just called to tell you that all those tears you shed for me they were not in vain for something happened tonight while traveling down a country road and i thought that you should be the first to know that i'm not the same and all those tears you pray they're over now those sleepless nights are past and all those prayers that you have prayed so long mama they're answered now at last for I'm not, I'm not the boy that I used to be. Mama, you can sleep tonight, for I found Jesus. Now everything's all right. And I remember how every night before you'd go to sleep, I'd hear you ask the Lord, my soul to keep, and that I might find the way. Oh, and I'm so thankful that through all of my loneliness and all those wasted years, Mommy, those prayers you prayed they kept ringing in my ears every night and day. And all those temper tears that you have shed for so long, oh, Mama, they're not after, they're not going to be anymore. For all those prayers that you have prayed so long, Mama, they're answered now at last, for I'm not, 
No, I'm not the boy that I used to be. Mama, you can sleep tonight, for I found Jesus. Now everything's all right. Amen. 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 Aren't you thankful that we're not what we used to be? If you're saved tonight, praise the Lord for that. Anybody else? Word of testimony, answer to prayer. I want to give you an opportunity here. Preacher, I'm History. thankful. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rob. I'm so thankful for all the many things he's done for me. And, and, uh, if I had to count them, I wouldn't know how to start. So, yeah. It's just one right after another. Yeah. It's like that song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. Yeah, very much. You think you haven't been blessed, you start doing that, it will surprise you what the Lord Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm just thankful for uh, God's word that He's given us, and uh, today's times that we live in, the fear of Antichrist is trying to see me. Yep. But God gives us His word and the word that we need to know what to do. Amen. That's right. Very blessed people to have the entire word of God. That's good. Anybody else? Just something to build on that song my dad was singing, and then even like this morning sermon. Um, it's been a while back, I don't know time frame wise, but it was just like a something laid on my heart that like um, on this earth, like is there a closer relationship than like what you would have with your child? Like, I mean, as a mom, we might be the closest thing to to them as far as praying for them. Like, if we're not going to pray for them, don't depend on someone else to be praying That's for right, them. Yeah. So, it was just something that was, like, um, just a thought that I had on my mind and I stewed on and thought that I would share with our our mom group sometime. It's just, you know, being praying for our children because as, you're, as the mom and father of those children, you are the closest person in their family, in, in their life. So, I feel like it's, you know, just... Just another conviction, just to be praying and praying for your children. Yeah, don't agree. be expecting anybody else to be praying for them if you're not going to be. Yeah, and I think you know it's. I'm very blessed you know, because the sacrifice Becky has made over the years. And of course, we talked about it early on, and we both felt led from the start. Uh, as soon as we started having kids, that that was going to be her place within the home. Uh, that was more important than anything else was teaching and training the children, and she. Gave herself to that, and then there was times, uh, you know, that when I would come home, I would be able to add a little bit to that. But she did a lot with them through the day, and uh, just that character building, that consistent character building. Boy, I tell you what, it's it's so very important. So appreciate if you have moms that's invested in your life like that. You really, really, really need to appreciate them. Uh, and like I said this morning, you can't just say, "Yeah, I'm thankful for it." <coughs> you need to tell them so. You need to tell them how thankful you are. You need to tell them you love them. Uh, that goes a long way uh, because I guarantee you they're burden, burden for you as well. That's good. Anybody else? Yes. I just thank, just like to thank the Lord for my mother and for giving me a great family and a great church. Amen. Praise the Lord. God's good to us. Anybody else? I know it's silly, but I, I usually, when it's Father's Day and Mother's Day, I ask God to tell them everything's okay. I'm just as crazy as I was when they was here, and they're still trying to tell a joke. <laughs> I believe God tells you. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Don't want to take an opportunity away. Yes, Dave? Um, my mother's 88 years old, and I think she's going to outlive me. And I understand the blessing it is for her still to be here. I mean, she's at the place, and she knows this, and I know this. She's saved, and she's ready to be with the Lord, and she could go, you know, anytime soon, I suppose. But it is a blessing for her to be here and to be able to have that length of time with my mother. Yeah. Amen. Great privilege there. Bits. All right, well, before I get into uh, 
what we're going to be doing here this evening. I want to let you know on the Christmas joy bags, we do, uh, this is what we have total left. Uh, we have eight calculators. I'll put this in the bulletin. Uh, first chance I get eight calculators, 18 crayons. Uh, that's the box of crayons. 24, um, the metal cars, the little cars. Uh, 35, the toothpaste, the four and a half ounces, still need many of those. And then uh, 12 baseball caps. <laughs> 11 baseball caps. <laughs> don't go shopping and can't find these things, you can always give money and just designate that Christmas joy bags and, and I can pass that on to the ladies because they go out and they go shopping and they're looking for this stuff uh, and that will help relieve some of their costs as well. Um, but you can always give money towards that. So just make a note there. Alright, before we get into tonight's message, I had a question from the question box I want to answer. I actually had a couple I'm not going to be able to answer all. There's still a few uh, I'm going through just praying for the Lord's timing. I try to get to them as soon as I can, <clears throat> and uh, I just have to wait until the Lord says, okay, this is the time to answer that one. So hopefully the one who put the question in the box, uh, and you know, they're usually pretty good Bible questions, but the one who puts the question in the box, hopefully they're there when I go over it. If they're not, well, the Lord knows. So uh, this question here was actually uh, about uh, our time change and doing it. And so I thought, well, this would be a good time to address it because I think we need to have, as a church, we need to have some understanding. And just wants to know why we're uh, doing the time change because we voted on this like eight years ago. Uh, so let me go over a couple things here of why this came up again. And I just want to cover this quickly because I want to get into the message message. But first of all, we need to realize this is not a doctrinal thing we're talking about here. Um, the Bible says when something is not doctrinal, if it was doctrinal, if it was about, uh, you know, we're going to change the Bible versions, we ought to kick up a fuss, every one of us. If we're going to change Bible doctrine, we ought to kick up a fuss. Now, if we're not doing that, then the Bible says, let everything be done decently and in order. So how does that affect with a time change? Well, if you look around our church right now, the dynamics of our church have changed from what it was eight years ago. Uh, we don't have all the same people. We have some that have been here. Uh, some have been here since the church was first built. You know? <laughs> <laughs> They've been here forever. But we, we have a lot of new folks. We have a lot of new families. Uh, some of the people we have actually were teenagers, and now they're adults, and they have families of their own. So the dynamics of a church continually change. So what that means is needs are always changing. Now this would be similar uh, to a business. If you had many, we have many people who are in business here. If you were in business and you said, well, uh, let's say you have a mechanic shop up here. You charge 50 bucks for changing a flat tire. Now I know that's a little high for changing a flat tire, but let's say you charge 50 bucks for changing a flat tire. Are you gonna have that same fee for the next 50 years? Not if you want to stay in business. Why? Because the dynamics change. As the price of everything else goes up, the, your costs go up. Now here we're just talking about uh, a time change. So we're talking about people's situations are a little bit different. I was talking to Gracie here before the service, and Gracie said, wow, you know, I love these early services because she gets up at, you know, what, 3 o'clock, you said? 3 o'clock to go to work. Now, that fits her schedule this helps her but it may not help you so what do we do in that situation do we try to please this group and not please that group obviously not well we always go to the bible and see what the bible says so how do we do this decently and in order well first of all i hope you don't think me as the pastor and the deacons we're just sitting there thinking well we're kind of bored let's see if we can change something else around here okay? <laughs> Because it's not like that. This is something I know I have prayed about for about five years. Because I see the dynamics changing. And I'm constantly like, Lord, do we need to stay this way? Do we need to do this? Uh, I would be okay with whatever time we have. If we had you know, church service at four in the morning, I'm going to be here. You know, Not because I'm the pastor, but because this is the right thing to do. Now, 
That may not fit in your schedule because you may be providentially hindered at that time. So uh, we pray about these things. We consider it. Uh, and then when we think the time is right, okay, well, this just happened to come up. And I think it fits in God's time frame. So what does the Bible say about the whole thing? And we have prayed about it. And I, here's what I've asked you all to do is pray about it. Now, if you haven't prayed about it, that's on you, okay? Uh, you're not going to be in God's will without seeking his face. And that's with anything in life. Because you're depending on your own knowledge and your own desires. Now, I don't know who asked the question or whatever, but I think it was a good question. I think it was a legitimate question. And I think they were honestly wanting to know. So here's some things as we think about the dynamics of the church changing. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to a few places here. Romans chapter 15 is the first place I'd have you turn. Because, again, we want to do something decently in an order. And, again, this is not a doctrinal issue. So we want to have unity in the church. Now, we may be able, there are some people who maybe can't come to the 730 service that can come to the 630. We may not know that until six months down the road because they didn't realize we had the 630 evening service. Uh, and it may be the Lord brings somebody into our church that's not here now that that works better for their schedule. Again, we don't know the future, but God does. And this is where we just kind of have to be led of the Lord and see what the Lord wants. Uh, so Romans chapter 15, look at verse 1 if you would. It says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And notice this last phrase. And not to please ourselves. Now, I know some people love the 2 o'clock service or the one thirty service. So what if we just change it permanently to 1.30 or 2 o'clock? What if I'm the one that liked it and said, well, hey, that's what we're changing to. I wouldn't be abiding by this verse. Because I have to do things decently in order and consider the whole, what is going to benefit the most people. And that's why it says, and not to please ourselves. And verse 2 says, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. So we need to think about the welfare of the whole congregation. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And hopefully this will help you. And if you have some verses that contradict what I'm telling you, please feel free to bring them to me. But I think this is what the Lord uh, would have for us because, again, this is not a doctrinal thing. This is something that's decently and in order. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 24 says this, says, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Now that's not talking about you need to go uh, trying to get into their, tap into their bank account. That's not what that's talking about. It says, in other words, you want their welfare. You want what's best for them. It's not what's best for you, it's what's best for you. Them. That's the mindset we need to have as a whole. And I think our deacons have that mindset. I have that mindset. Uh, the Lord knows my heart. And uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 13. This is the love chapter. The love chapter. Notice what we find right smack dab in the middle. Verses 4 through 7, and actually the first part of verse 8, charity never faileth. From verse 4 down through the first part of verse 8 are all descriptions of what perfect love is. And notice what it says here in verse 5. It says, doth not behave itself unseemly. And notice these next four words. Seeketh not her own. You see how we ought not be seeking what we want. It's okay to say, yes, this is what I would prefer. But is that what's best for the whole? Does that make sense? Yeah. We need to look at the welfare of the whole church. Philippians chapter 2 is the last place I'd have you turn, and I think this would be enough uh, on this one particular thing. But, And again, I thought that was a, a good question. I thought it was a legitimate question. Um, but that's the thing, when the dynamics of the church continually change, some churches, it may change slower. Ours changes sometimes quickly. We have people who are shut-ins now that were not shut-ins back then. We have other people, uh, you know, a lot of our teenagers have grown up, and now they're young adults, and they're still here in the church. So, Things like that will continually change. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 3 if you would. This is a very important one because what would the devil love more than anything else? He wants to divide. He wants us to find any little thing that we can to start getting upset over and, you know, to start causing division. And this can happen from people who have good intentions. 
And it can happen so unexpectedly. Uh, it catches us off guard sometimes. So be careful of that. We all need to be careful of that. We need to watch it. It says here in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That means that vainglory is what you want. It's for your benefit. So let nothing be done that way. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Notice what it says in verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, Christ wasn't looking out for himself. He was looking out what was for the benefit of others. And that's what we need to do. That's one of the most important principles, I think, when we think about things being done decently and in order. Uh, how we do a service. How, you know, how many songs do we sing during a service? You know, all the things that go into that, it's all about decently and in order. The Bible doesn't say thou shalt sing three songs and sing, you know, all four verses to every song. It doesn't say that. It's what's decently and in order. So what is the benefit and welfare of the whole church? And then you have to trust the Lord's leading in other people's lives. Now, I'm trusting the Lord's leading in your life. Uh, and again, the time change that we've done so far for the month of May this may not be what we go with. We may try some stuff, and, and we may try this again uh, down the road sometime. And, and just it might be two years before the Lord says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stick to the time you had on Sunday night, Wednesday night. I want you to change it. <clears throat> we don't know. But you know what we ought to have? We ought to have a spirit that's teachable, and we ought to have a spirit that's willing to be led of the Lord. Yep. And if God says change the time to 5 o'clock, we ought to jump to 5 o'clock. If he says change it to 8, we ought to jump to 8 o'clock. That's the attitude we need to have. Now, if you don't have that attitude, and I think the person who asked this question probably does, but if they don't have that attitude or if somebody else doesn't have that attitude, you're in dangerous territory as a Christian because that's a rebellious spirit, and God's not going to tolerate that. So we want to be very careful uh, when it comes to that. So remember, we want to, and this is where we need to pray, Lord, what is best for our church? It might not be what's going on with our church right now, Again, this might be where our church is a year from now. What is best for us at that time? So that's kind of the mindset we need to have. Now, take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 11, if you would. Psalm 11. This is not uh, a question, but this is kind of addressing the same thing. Uh, something that we are dealing with this week. Tuesday is Election Day. So we need to be ready for that. And I just, I'm going to go over this very quickly here because our time is short. Psalm 11, look at verse 1 if you would. It says, In the Lord put I my trust, how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may prettily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hated. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Now, verse 3 is a very important verse, but... I want to talk here tonight, preach tonight, just very quickly, a message about our Christian duty as a citizen. What do we do with elections? What do we do when these things come up? Our foundations are constantly under attack in this country. And I'm not just talking about our freedoms. I'm talking about the Christian foundations in this country. And so we need to realize there's a spiritual battle going on, and it's under attack. We're seeing it going on in our cities. Uh, we're seeing the chaos that's reigning. And here's why. It's because God's going to rain snares against these people. He's going to rain judgment against them because they are fighting against what God wants. So let's pray and we'll look at a few things here in the message. Father, we thank you for your blessings. I thank you for your love and goodness to us. And Lord, I do pray that you will continually direct our steps and direct our hearts. And uh, Lord, we just want to move as one body and, and just go where you lead us in everything. And when we think about the elections coming up, uh, Tuesday, I hope that we all do our Christian duty. I hope that uh, if we haven't already done so, that Lord, we will let you guide and lead us uh, in every area of our life, especially when it comes to even our government. And Father, we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
So what do we do? The devil is obviously trying to attack our foundations. And this is why it's important for us to know the Bible. We need to know where God would have us to stand. We, know, we need to know what the important issues are to God. And if they're important to him, they need to be important to us. And uh, so let me give you some things here that we can do for our country. How can we be a good Christian but also fulfill our duty as a citizen at the same time? First of all, we need to pray. We had better pray. We talk about corrupt politicians all we want, but who is more corrupt? The politician or those who are not praying for the politician who were clearly told to pray for the politician? Now, the Lord just brought that to my mind the other day as I was preparing for this message, and he got all over my toes. Because I can complain about the president, the governor, I can complain about all these things. But if I am not praying for them, I am clearly disobeying God's word, what he said to do. So who's more corrupt, them or me? I know better. They don't. We have to consider these things. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, that's God's people, children, his children, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. It tells us also that we are not always to pray and not to faint. We need to pray that God will change the hearts of the godless. Pray for the salvation of lost leaders. Pray that godly officials will be elected. I want you to turn to one other place here, and this is the last place I'll have you turn tonight. The rest of them is going to kind of give you some quick information. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. When we think about praying for our politicians, and I'm going to tell you sometimes it's hard to know exactly how to pray for certain politicians. It is hard. It's like, I want to pray those imprecatory prayers Dave was talking about in the adult son. I want to pray God's wrath down on the ungodly. <laughs> but you better be in God's will if you're going to pray something like that. A lot of those people are not saved. That's why, you know, should it surprise us that lost people do what lost people do? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't surprise us. We ought to expect it. They're in sin. They don't know any better. They're blinded. So we need to pray God opens their eyes. They receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and he makes them a new creature in Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 1 and 2. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Right there is very plain. We need to pray for our leaders. But you know what the Lord kind of threw up in my face right as I was reading this, those two verses? And this is one thing I'm going to have to confess to you. I have not done much of. And I need to start going. Let's read it again very carefully. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, that is a type of prayer. Prayers, that's another type of prayer. Intercessions, another type of prayer. And giving of thanks. Think of the politician that's been getting on your nerves. When's the last time you gave God thanks for that politician? Mm. Yeah, I thought so. That was me too. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see that before, Lord. <laughs> but it's there. And giving a thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Not just the ones you like and the ones you don't like. It's for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet, peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Are we living a quiet, peaceful life in our country? Maybe it's because God's people are not giving thanks for the kings that God has set up and the kings he has put down. We need to stop and reconsider some of this. Praying is so very important when it comes to our leaders. So let's try to pray more than what we have. Pray more effectively. Here's another thing we can do if we're going to fulfill our duty, uh, Christian duty as a citizen. You need to register to vote. Do you realize, you know, when it comes to registering to vote, with privileges come responsibilities. We are truly privileged in this country to live in America. What a privilege that is. Yes. Millions of God's people aren't even registered to vote. Shame on us. Yep. Amen. 
Shame on us. We had in this last presidential election, and I don't I think the numbers are correct. I think there were some shenanigans obviously going on. But let's assume the numbers are correct. I don't remember even what they were, but it was like a total of 100, and, almost 160 million people voted. That is almost 10 to 20 million people more than has ever voted in any other presidential election. Do you realize the numbers should be a lot higher than that? We have a lot of people who claim the name of Christ who aren't even registered to vote. Shame on us. And young people who are turning 18, no excuse. It's time you fulfill your Christian duty. Proverbs 11, verse 11. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. We want God's blessing, and the upright has to do something. There are three institutions that God has ordained, and he wants you and I, if you are saved, he wants you to have a part in all three. What are those three institutions that God has established? The first one was the home. What was the second one? It was, the second was the state. That was the government came into play. And then in the New Testament, it was the church. God wants you to have a part in all three. So we need to do that. We need to make sure we're fulfilling our Christian duty. So pray, register to vote. Here's another one. Be informed. So many people in the past have voted because of whatever silly reason they ever had to vote. Name recognition. You know what name recognition does? There's a guy running, I can't remember what office it's for, uh, but I just remember it's more capital. Anybody remember that? I think it's a guy at this time. It was his mom, Shelly Moore Capital, who ran. And you know why she got in office? Because her dad was a governor, Governor Moore, remember him? It's name recognition. And how many people voted for them just because of name recognition? Oodles. Now, you might have been one. We all are guilty, but we better be informed of who's running. What do they stand for? Don't just make assumptions. Some people just recognize the name and they go with it. Uh, I've said for many years, if I've changed a couple things and changed my name to a couple things, I guarantee you I could run for president and get elected. That's how uninformed our populace is. And sadly, it's many Christians who are also the same way. Matthew 10, verses 16 through 18 tells us we need to be wise as serpents. That means we have to be well informed of our surroundings. When you go places, we teach our kids this. I teach all of the kids, especially the girls. When they go to a gas station to fill up for gas, as a matter of fact, Abigail's learning to drive now. We just passed the gas station the other day. I said, oh, by the way, you stop here at the Shell gas station. You don't ever get gas when it's dark outside on the last pump. You always get gas right by the front doors. You do that anywhere. Why? Because wise as serpents, you need to be aware of your surroundings. What's going on? If you think we're living in the good old America of 30, 40, 50 years ago, you are wrong. There is sex trafficking everywhere. There's all kinds of things. Kids coming up missing all the time. Be aware of your surroundings. Same thing with government. Proverbs 24, verse 5 says, A wise man is strong, yea, a man of knowledge doesn't stop there. He increases his strength. So know the candidates. Know the laws. Know how our representatives are voting. Don't be deceived by what people say today. People can change. You know what the best predictor is of the future? Is what have they done in the past? If they have voted for abortion for the last 30 years, what makes you think they're going to change? They're not. So we need to make sure we understand Now people can change, but just because they say something different, and they've got a magic D or an R next to their name. Does not mean a thing. We need to make sure we're aware. Also, here's another one. Help elect godly candidates. Now, you can do that through voting, obviously. But Proverbs 29, verse 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Do you know how you can help elect godly candidates? Run for office. Anybody ever considered that? Has anybody ever said, Lord, do you want me running for office? I prayed that before. And I thought, well, if the Lord wanted me to... There are some pastors in our state who have run for office until they can get a godly candidate in that position. So it's in the House of Representatives. It's in our Senate. They have run for office. There's a couple right now that's still in office. And they're pastoring. 
Now, I'm not saying that's for everybody, but they're doing it because nobody has stepped up to the plate. Who's going to run for office? Some people don't want to run for office because, like, well, you run for office, you're going to be like everybody else. You're going to be a corrupt politician. Not if you're walking in the Spirit. We need some politicians who are doing that, who are walking in the Spirit. And it's not people who know how to work politics. It's just everyday people who understand what's going on. And they need to be, they should be Christians. It'd be great if they're Christians. That would be an extra plus. Exodus 18, verse 21 gives us four qualifications for leaders. It says there that they need to be able men. That means they need to demonstrate capability. They need to fear God. They should have godliness of character, not just saying that they, oh yeah, I'm religious. Yeah, I'm a Christian. And then they live like the devil. It doesn't work that way. Uh, they should be men of truth, honesty. You know, President Biden, one of the things... I feel so, so sorry for that. I know he's as lost as can be. He is the world's biggest liar. You can't hardly believe anything coming out, and that's terrible. But that's why he needs our prayers. He needs prayer of salvation. Now, you voted for him. That's between you and God. I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm just telling you, we better find out what God's mind is on this thing and then obey and simply do it. We need to find people. Another qualification was this. People who hate covetousness. You know what has ruined more politicians in America? <coughs> is covetousness. You realize in uh, our national government, in the House of Representatives, uh, there in the Senate as well, uh, they can do what's called insider trading. They get some inside information about what something's going to happen in a company or what's going to happen uh, in uh, some type of futures a commodities contract. They can either pass that information on to relatives where they... They make millions of dollars in this stuff, and they actually get fined because they're convicted of insider trading, and they get fined like, I can't remember what it is, $10,000. That's a pretty good trade-off. Why? Because they love covetousness. We need people who are not going to be bought off, not who's going to go in and, and have some person come in who's wanting to... Uh, buy their vote or whatever, say, I'll give you a new car. This happens all the time. I'll give you a new car. You vote for this particular policy. We need people of character, people who have some grit to help elect godly candidates. Another thing is, and I mentioned this already, vote. We ought to vote for biblical principles before voting for a party or a particular candidate. Your party is not going to save America. No party is going to save America. It's godliness that's going to save America. That's what we need to vote for. Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Somebody said, well, I don't know who to vote for. There's nobody good. Well, let me tell you this. God is always on the ballot. Always on the ballot. You don't think it matters to God who we vote for? It definitely does. Who's the one who sets kings up and who's the one that puts them down? God. God. Who has he given the responsibility and the privilege to be able to vote for those people? Us. Us. It matters to God. We need to get his mind on that. And here's another one. Uh, we can't be a great citizen if we are not a great Christian first. That's very important. Your first priority is to make sure your salvation is settled. Your second priority is to grow in Christ. As you're growing in Christ, you're going to gain wisdom in making decisions. And we are to rely on the Lord for direction and what we need to do. That's why Proverbs 3, uh, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Every election, I pray the same thing. Lord, I, I, I want to know who to vote for. I do my homework. I do my research. I try to help other people to know more about candidates. There's some candidates I don't know much about. I try to find out everything I can. I don't care what office they're running for. Now, these small local offices, it's hard to find information where they stand on certain issues. But, you know, we need to understand that God does care about these things. And here's another thing we can do as a good citizen, our good Christian dude. Contact your representatives. Some of you are part of the email list, uh, Baptist for Biblical Values. And, and whenever I get some information, I pass that on to you. What's going on in our currents in West Virginia? If you live in Virginia... I don't know if they have anything like that, but I'm glad we do in West Virginia. And uh, they pass along bills that matter to Christians. Hey, contact your representative. Let them know you're for this or against this.
They need to know this. And you know what politicians do? You've heard that saying before, the squeaky wheel does what? It gets the grease, it gets the, grease, gets the oil, you know, whatever. That's true. And here's the way politicians look at this. And I had one of them tell me that. Matter of fact, I called uh, uh, Senator Manchin's office here, I don't remember, probably three or four years ago about something. And uh, I called the office, and I was talking to this individual, and he said, you know, for every person that we hear from, we naturally assume there are about 10,000 more people that they represent that agree with them. What would happen if everybody in our church contacted them? You think that would change some things? But what do we do? Well, they're probably not going to do anything I say anyway. But we still have a responsibility. Now, I don't have time to call them all. I don't have time to email them all. But a lot of times what I do is I'll type up an email and I'll copy and paste and send email after email. I can do that very quickly. Instead of being on the phone with them all day and trying to get to this person and talk to that person. And, and here's another thing. When you contact your representative, be polite. Be courteous. You know, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Our words do matter. So we need to realize these things as Christians. We can be a godly Christian, but we can be a good citizen as well, and they should go hand in hand, not separate from one another. So those are some things we can do. So when Election Day is coming up, I know Virginia is a little bit different. Their timing is different. West Virginia is coming up here Tuesday. Whatever your Election Day is, realize we have a responsibility. We need to see what these people are, uh, are voting for. Some people don't vote in the primaries. They vote mainly in the, the general election. And, uh, but you know what? How do, the, how do the candidates get to the general election? they got to get past the primaries. So we want to make sure the best people are getting to the general election. Then we vote for the best person. Who does God want in that particular case? And it's not a thing wrong with saying, Lord, I'm just not really sure. You know, I've done my homework, but I'm still not sure. Who would you have me to vote for? And I promise you, if you are just trusting God, he is going to lead you in the right direction. But let's be a good citizen. Let's be a good American and a good Christian at the same time. Let's all stand and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. And I thank you for our church. And, and uh, Lord, I know there was a, a lot of instruction tonight. But I think that's okay. I think that's what you would have us to do. But, Lord, we do need to know these things. As we talked earlier, we want to be in unity. We want to have your mind on the matter of things, whether we're changing the time, changing the color of the carpet, painting the walls, whatever it is we're doing, Lord, we need to make sure we're doing what you want us to do, when you want us to do it. And then, Lord, I pray also when it comes to the election, Lord, we need to make sure we understand that you care about these things. You care about the issues that are on the ballot. And, Lord, we need to be as informed as possible. And, Lord, I try, as you lead me, I try to inform our people as much as I can about different candidates, what they stand for on different issues. It doesn't matter what party they belong to. Uh, but we need to know. And then what we do is between us and you. And, Lord, we need to make sure that we're just simply being obedient uh, to what it is you're showing us. And, Father, we thank you for the great privilege we have to be able to vote in this country. Amen. I know Amen. we have been discouraged in the past. We know every election there's corruption and things that go on. Those things happen, but they're in your hands. We still have a responsibility. You have not taken that privilege away, so we have a responsibility to do it. And so, Father, help us to see that. I know there are times when people are away and they can't vote. Maybe they can early vote. Uh, but whatever, There's, there are times when we just aren't able to do it. But, Lord, help us while we're able to let our voice be heard and let it be heard in a very Christ-honoring way. And, uh, Lord, we know that will please you. We want to hear you say one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And uh, so, Lord, whether... It's as an American, whether it's simply as a Christian, as a West Virginian or Virginia, it doesn't matter. Help us, Lord, just to be obedient to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and I pray that you'll bless this invitation time now. In Christ's name we ask it.